SVS, a name synonymous with home theater, especially when it comes to subwoofers. 10 inch, 12 inch, 13 inch, and their flagship 16 inch ultra series. Beasts, the 1000 series were their entry level options, which is still incredibly popular today. But on February 26, 2021, that all changed. The 1000 series went pro. Cabinets were completely redesigned, able to push low frequencies to reference levels without distortion. 10 inches grew to 12. 300 watts RMS became 325 with their Sledge STA325D internal amplifier. Basically taking all the technology once reserved for their more expensive subwoofers and somehow cramming it into a package costing only $499 or $599. Game, set, match. Nobody else comes close. I've been personally listening to the ported PB1000 Pro in my home, so I'll go over my observations and give you an honest review. Let's get into it. Hello everyone in YouTube land. I'm Elon Osborne and this is my channel where I talk about movies, audio, and music. And if you enjoy those things too and find this video helpful, please hit that like button. I'll do the stuff. The PB1000 Pro has a 12 inch driver with two sexy ports underneath to push all that air through and rumble all the way down to a brain tingling 17 hertz. On the rear, we have a power cord reservoir, power switch, left and right speaker level inputs, trigger input to allow your receiver to control your subwoofer powering on and off, unbalanced RCA inputs and outputs, including an LFE input, USB port for an SVS SoundPath wireless audio adapter, and an updated control panel previously only found on the more expensive subs. This control panel is nice and simplistic in its execution, where you press the button you want to adjust first, then use the plus and minus buttons to make those adjustments. For example, if you want to adjust the volume, first press the volume button, then adjust with the plus and minus as indicated by these blue LEDs. Change the crossover frequency by pressing this button first, then plus and minus to adjust. You can also toggle between 0 and 180 degrees for your phase. And lastly, by pressing this button, you can choose either auto on, where it automatically turns on when it receives an audio signal, as indicated by this on, off, on LED sequence. Or you can have it always on, indicated by all three LEDs lit up. Abity, Abity, app, app, app. All right then, let's navigate to the App Store. Search for SVS, uh, not SCS, SVS subwoofer. For demonstration purposes, I'm downloading it again. Open. Would like to use your Bluetooth. Okay, welcome to SVS, connect to subwoofer. Sure, press the arrow to proceed. Okay, connect to subwoofer, yes. Wow, instant. Ta-da! Now previously I named it PB Beast, so it still had that name on file. Yours will probably be named some sort of like PB1000 Pro bleep blop blorp numbers letters. Subwoofer is now connected, hooray! Uh, let's continue the tutorial, which is nice, because it just kind of goes over the app in a nutshell for you. We're just gonna get out of that for now. Automatically, it just kind of goes to negative 10 dB, which is pretty cool, because if you go to this drop down preset menu here, your presets are movie mode, music mode, custom, and default. At this point, you can select the options box here which will show you a bunch of parameters you can adjust. But at the same time, you can also access this menu from the main menu at the top right. Ta-da! Let's do that. Let's go to the low pass filter. A lot of times you'll use the low pass filter if you want to use it for music or if you have this set up as part of a music system. But typically you'll want to use the LFE mode when you are setting this up for a home theater because LFE means low frequency effects, which is actually a very specific code within the audio that your receiver will decode because a lot of times it'll be mixed so that the LFE channel not only involves frequencies maybe 80 hertz and below, but maybe sometimes it goes all the way up to 120, you never know. It just depends on how it was mixed by the mixing engineers when that movie was mastered. 
So choosing this to be off automatically puts it into LFE mode, which allows your receiver to decide what frequencies will be sent to the subwoofer. But if you do choose to use this low pass filter, press this here to turn it on, bloop, and you can adjust it like so, either sliding it or you can press these arrows, right, left, you can change the slope as well. The slope is just how quickly that low pass filter drops off. The bigger the number, the quicker that slope drops off. So let's just keep it at the default. And I'm just gonna turn this off once again because since it's a home theater setting, I want it off. Let's go to the parametric EQ. If you do have room calibration software such as REW, which is actually free to download, the only thing that might cost you some money is if you get a nice room calibration microphone. Those usually cost, I don't know, somewhere about 80 to 120 to 150, the list goes up. But after you have run the room calibration software, it will show you if there are particular peaks and uh, dips in volume where there shouldn't be. So in this case, if you do see a particular dip at a certain frequency, let's say, or let's just turn it on and say you found out that, oh, uh, 80 hertz, you see a dip of three decibels. So you would want to counteract that by going up to 80 hertz, boop, boop, 80 hertz. And then you want to go up. You want to boost it three decibels since you had a dip of three decibels. So you want to just even it out. And then the Q factor is how narrow or wide that peak is. See that? See how it's really wide or really narrow. So you can mess with that as well. Again, this is something you want to do after you have calibrated your room and checked out where there might be some spots and which frequencies might be a little too loud or a little too quiet because of how your room is shaped or furniture in the way, etc. So we'll just go ahead and turn that off again. Next up, presets. You can edit the name. Let's say we want to do quiet mode. Okay, so now that we're back on the home screen, let's go to the quiet preset that we just renamed. And well, let's say, let's put it down to negative 36. Boop, negative 36. And then you'll hit this bottom arrow, boop, which brings up this little sub menu, save to preset, boop. We wanna save it to quiet, save. Cool. So now movie, oh yeah goes all the way to negative 10 and then quiet, boop, all the way down to negative 36 now. Hooray, we set that preset. Let's put it back to movie. Let's go to system settings. Here you can change the name of the subwoofer itself. As you can see, I named it PB Beast. Subwoofer standby, just like that button on the rear of the subwoofer allows you to choose these options as well. You can also do it within the app. You can reset to factory settings, contact SVS support, so many ways. Let's go back to the home screen. And that's pretty much a quick rundown of this app. Pretty intuitive, pretty self-explanatory, very user-friendly it seems. Pretty simple, it's great, and it's very handy. I like it. Since all of us YouTube creators gotta watch out for each other, Go check out this video from Youthman, who a couple years ago did a more in-depth video about the SVS app. So if you're wanting to dive in a little bit deeper, check it out even more. The link is in the description. Just to preface, the only other sub that I've actually dealt with personally in this house is the one that came with the Klipsch Reference Theater Pack, which is an 8-inch downward firing sub. And as you very well may know, it performed way better than I thought it would given its size. But my situation is unique given that when we first moved into this house, it was already set up to have a subwoofer placed high up on this shelf here, overlooking my main living area. You see, I have a media closet here, which then already had an RCA cable going up through this wall and out this hole, which then snakes around to the sub's current resting place. That was actually extremely advantageous because of the fact that this clip subwoofer is downward firing. So it fires those low frequencies down into this wall, essentially amplifying the audio coming from the subwoofer, which is why I'm able to get away with only having the subwoofer at about 30% or so I thought. 
Uh oh. You see, since I wanted to put the SVS sub under the TV, but then I also have a media closet, which is a fair distance away, I was in a little bit of a pickle. So I went down to Best Buy and got myself two 15 foot subwoofer cables. But that's also because I did not have the SoundPath wireless adapter to make this subwoofer wireless. But you can learn from my silly mistake because I totally spaced the fact that if an RCA cable run is more than 20 feet, it is way more prone to interference and signal degradation. So as soon as I joined those two 15 foot cables with a female to female RCA coupler, plugged it into the SVS and turned it on, I heard that dreaded 60 Hertz hum. Duh, note. I could have gotten away with a cable run 30 feet or more had I got a more expensive subwoofer cable, like the SVS SoundPath RCA Audio Interconnect cable with its five layer dielectric insulation system. But you know, I was in a pinch, so I got the basic Insignia brand Best Buy subwoofer cables that are really thin. But silly me, I should have seen it coming that I was gonna get that 60 Hertz hum. So since I couldn't venture too far away from my media closet, I had to settle on placing the sub here between my main listening position and off to the side a little bit. But you, my friend, might want to invest in the wireless adapter kit from SVS or a more expensive shielded subwoofer cable. So then you just have more options on where you can put the subwoofer. So how does it sound? Let me make this comparison since the only other subwoofer I've heard in this house is my 8 inch Klipsch. It's like going from a teenager with lots of energy, lots of angst, lots of pizzazz and punch to a more mature subwoofer. The bass has more body, it's more rounded. The slight rough edges that I might have heard with the Klipsch 8 inch subwoofer is now more refined, cleaner with the PB1000 Pro. Right away, that's just one major difference between eight inches and 12 inches. But the other part that I was blown away by with this entry-level SVS subwoofer, entry-level being the biggest understatement of 2021, is that the cabinet design is so solid, engineered to be so rigid, is that it allows for incredibly true, uncolored low frequency output without resonance or distortion, even at high volumes. Let me explain it in a different way. One reason I don't like to turn up my clip subwoofer more than 50% is that if you go any higher, you really start to hear the cabinet itself resonating. I mean, granted, this is the cheapest subwoofer that Klipsch offers since it comes with the reference theater pack. So it's not like it's supposed to produce the best ever low frequency experience. But here's where I'm gonna get real honest about the PB1000 Pro. Because it's a 12 inch driver, it honestly lacks the punch that the Klipsch does have. Again, like an angsty teen, the Klipsch has punch, power, and most importantly, speed. I mean, because it's only an eight inch driver, the attack and release are just quicker. Being able to oscillate back and forth at explosive speeds and moving a 12 inch driver at those same speeds would require a tremendous amount of power. So scenes like the tunnel shootout in John Wick 2, I noticed the gunshots weren't as punchy with the SVS as they were with the Klipsch. The best I could compare the two experiences is this. With gunshots, especially when John picks up the shotgun about halfway through the scene, the SVS produced a deep, wide womp womp, whereas the Klipsch produced a quick, impactful thum thum. So I honestly was just a little bit disappointed with the SVS after watching that scene in particular, since I was just so used to getting that tight, quick thum thum from the Klipsch. But, and as you can see, that's a really big but. Did the SVS still sound incredible? Of course. It still produced such a deep and clean womp womp that I just wasn't used to. So that made me think, maybe that's the difference between this 1000 Pro series and the more expensive 2000 or 3000 series. That maybe those subwoofers just have a little bit more power behind them so they are able to move those drivers at a faster speed. So what say ye? Are you team womp womp or team thum thum?
Also, if you do own a higher tier SVS sub, leave a comment below. I'm curious to know your experience with action movies, particularly gunfights. My last slightly negative impression with the PB1000 Pro is that it wasn't as loud as I thought it would be. If you set the SVS app to the movie preset, for example, it automatically sets the volume to negative 10 decibels. And in my large open concept living room, that was actually where I liked it. But even when I max out its volume at zero dB, it didn't shake the pictures off my walls or rattle my windows or make me want to cover my ears. Yeah, but why would you ever want to turn it up that loud? I wouldn't. This is true. But the fact that I haven't even attempted to turn my clip sub all the way to the max tells you a lot. Because even at 50%, it's already nearing that point where I don't wanna turn it up much louder just to test the integrity of my eardrums. And remember when I said the cabinet of the eight inch clips isn't the best? I know for a fact that if I turned it all the way up to its max, I would just hate it because it would resonate and vibrate that cabinet so much that it would just sound like garbage. But since those are really the only complaints that I have about the PB1000 Pro, they're minor at best. Sure, I was only slightly disappointed with John Wick, but every other subwoofer workout scene that I put it up against, it passed with flying colors. The chest rumbling subsonic frequencies in the intro to Blade Runner 2049, 100. The ginormous scale of the fights in Godzilla King of the Monsters, money. The tunnel chase scene in The Dark Knight, fire. The footsteps and the impacts of the elephants in Return of the King, insane. And the SVS thrived in moments like those. Now, want me to tell you something I was genuinely surprised to find out? Yes, I did test out the SVS versus the Klipsch, but you know me and subwoofers. So of course I tested the SVS with the Klipsch. Remember how I had that Klipsch subwoofer up on that wall shelf? Well, since the SVS had to be placed just below it, I sure as hell couldn't keep it up there while testing the two. Besides, since owning the Klipsch subwoofer, I really hadn't had a chance to hear it anywhere else besides up on that shelf. So I was really curious to know if indeed it really was enhanced by being on top of that wall. So I placed it in this corner by the fireplace on the opposite side of the room. And let me tell you, that wall didn't do much at all. It still retained all of its power and punch, which was rather surprising. But also surprising was that for the first time, the clip sub was very noticeably directional. When it was on top of the wall, it was bass kind of hitting me from all angles. But over by the fireplace, it actually sounded like there was bass slightly coming from the left. Huh. The SVS was great in that it sounded like it was this omnipresent directionless bass filling up my living room. So that is one disadvantage of having an eight inch downward firing subwoofer in a large open concept living room. But having the two subwoofers working in tandem with each other, it was glorious. Oh. The deep, wide, huge bass coming from the SVS was complemented quite well with the raw, powerful, punchy Klipsch. That same tunnel shootout scene in John Wick 2 was like nothing I had experienced before with the two subwoofers working together. I was like a kid in a candy store since I had the chest rumbling womp womp from the SVS simultaneously working with the thum thum of the Klipsch. The best of both worlds. Of course, I recommend getting two matching subwoofers if you get two subwoofers at all. But I was honestly pleasantly surprised with how well those two worked together, since they both have quite different sounds. So there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed this rather unorthodox review of the PB1000 Pro. If there's one thing to take away from this video, it's that I hope you know the difference between Womp Womp and Thum Thum. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already so you don't miss another video like this one. And of course, always be listening.